Welcome to Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. Avoid them. Here's your host, Stacy Jones. Welcome to Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. I'm Stacey Jones, and I'm so happy to be here with you all today. I want to give a very warm welcome to Shamir Duverso. Shamir is the Managing Director, Chief Strategist, and Co-Founder of Smart Panda Labs, a digital experience agency that helps B2C enterprise marketers plan, build, and improve consumer digital experiences from customer acquisition to retention. Over the past 15 years, Shamir has held leadership roles overseeing everything from product management to digital strategy, including user and experience design, web development, testing, and web analytics. He's worked across a number of industries, spanning from travel to entertainment and technology, working with brands like Southwest Airlines, The Walt Disney Company, NBC Universal, and Marriott. Today, Shamir and I are going to be chatting about how to use customer data to enhance digital experiences. We'll learn what works from his perspective, what should be avoided, and how some companies and individuals just miss the mark. Shamir, welcome. So happy to have you here today. Thank you so much, Stacey. I'm happy to be here. Well, what I'd love to do is start off chatting about how you got here. I mean, you have worked at tremendous companies over the year, lifetime and your career. And what has led you to here today doing this? Uh, I think it's really the time that I worked at those companies. Um, it was really a time when the internet was really starting to take off and, and really become just not just kind of a, a side component, but a critical component of what you need to do to, to be in business today. And that was an enjoyable time. It was an exciting time, but it was also a very frustrating time <laughs> because um, departments had to work together uh, in new ways and in ways they weren't accustomed to, departments that didn't speak the, the same language, and particularly marketing and, and operations and IT um, really had to kind of blend together to be able to accomplish what you want to do in terms of delivering an experience online. Well, um, seeing the bureaucracy, seeing the frustration, seeing these huge gaps in knowledge and expertise and resources, um, really began to feel like, you know, this this is something that a lot of companies have and are going to have for, for a long period of time, trying to identify and fill those gaps. So um, after working through that in my own corporate life, I said, well, maybe I can help others <laughs> begin to work through that. So kind of gathered together some key people I'd worked with over the years, and, and we started Smart Panda Labs. And when you're first working with someone, what is it that you do? Is it a deep dive into their website and trying to understand how it flows? Or are you looking more so at the overall business and then connecting the dots? You know, it can be a little of both. Um, some clients come to us and they already kind of know what they what they feel like they're looking for, at least on a high level. Mm -hmm. um, others come to us a little bit more, um, as you kind of mentioned, maybe more kind of open and are looking for things. But definitely it's a process of really kind of saying, what is it that you're trying to accomplish overall in the business, even be above and beyond what you're doing digitally, just as a business, as an organization, what are you trying to accomplish what are your big term goals? And then we begin to look at those marketing tactics. What are you doing today? How do those tactics tie back to those goals? And then what needs to be enhanced and what's keeping you from enhancing it to be able to reach that? Because um, consumers today, they have an expectation of what a digital experience really is. Um, and that expectation isn't colored by the fact that maybe you're in an industry that's a little bit further behind than others are. It's colored by the leaders. It's colored by the, the Amazons of the world and the kind of experience you have there. And they expect that whether I go to an Amazon or another retailer, whether I go to a hospital website, whether I go to a travel website, I expect that same standard of experience. Um, so really helping people say, what is preventing you from getting to that standard? And how do we build the right foundation and framework to, to help you to, to achieve that and get there? Yep. And you're really helping make sure that people don't bounce three seconds after they've actually landed on your page. That's a general idea for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and that they can dial in and find the information that they're wanting because as Google is advancing so much and we're so used to using long tail keywords and dialing up the information we want, it is so frustrating getting onto a website mm -hmm. and not finding that nugget that you need. And it's yeah. buried somewhere that only the web designer might maybe have an idea of like 
three years ago. Okay, exactly. Uh, and that's that's a big part of what we identify too is we spend so much time as marketers in terms of what happens before the click, right? We spend so much time on perhaps SEO and trying to get the right ranking on the page, a lot of time, a lot of money on advertising, trying to get ads out there and trying to get someone to click. People only spend a few seconds on a search engine results page, only a, a few seconds interacting with an ad. The majority of their, their time happens post-click, but that's not where we spend our time and energy and resources as marketers. We spend all that time in the advertising. We spend all that time trying to get ranked. So we really try to help people kind of change that mentality a bit and say, hey, let's spend our money and energy and resources where people are spending their time on that user experience. So that exactly to your point, people can find what they're looking for, the information they need to convince them to say, yes, I want to move forward. I want to become a lead. I want to make this purchase or whatever that call to action happens to be. And you spend so much time and money paying to get someone top of funnel to your web page that it's kind of heartbreaking if you're having them bounce off of it when it's just beginning. The sale has just begun once they've landed. Exactly. That is exactly the case. Um, and, you know, there's so much opportunity, right, to, to really make that experience better. Because okay. if if I made the choice to make that click to come to your site, a piece of me wants to at least explore this, you know, worst case scenario, at best scenario, I, I, I want to be persuaded. I, I want to be convinced to make that purchase. So really, it's very, brands can be very quick to kind of get in the way of people doing what they on some level already want to do. But again, if we don't spend the right time there really understanding what the data is telling us people are trying to accomplish, then using that data to, to iterate and make changes so that people can do that more easily, we're, we're really kind of hurting ourselves. You know, and I know a lot of the websites that you work for and the business enterprises, like especially when it comes to a hospital, I mean, there's so much more that comes into that and laws that have to be there and protections and the like. But on the day-to-day -day on most websites, what are the traditional issues that you come across over and over again that you see that you're just like, come on, people, fix? <laughs> um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with... Um, not, not taking into account the, the architecture of the page, right? So um, maybe leading too much with design and making this look pretty, maybe leading too much with having um, a lot of uh, content that perhaps that we feel like is very um, uh, on brand, but not really thinking about, well, let's think about the person. Let's think about what they're looking for and what they're trying to accomplish on this page. How do we best organize that content and the way that people tend to organize and, and digest information and then how do we surface the information that someone really needs in order to make an informed decision? Right. Um, again, as marketers, we tend to be very creative, which is great. Um, we tend to think about big ideas. We tend to think about things like wow factors and things like that. And, that, and that's all well and good. But at its core, ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to tell a particular story that's going to resonate with that person so that that person can say, yes, this is what I'm looking for. This fulfills my need. You know, this, this, re this hits me on an emotional level. I'm ready to make a decision. I'm ready to move forward. And a website can be a tremendous tool at doing that, but we find a lot of websites don't have that issue because they haven't kind of thought through how do we structure this page in the organization by extension? How do we structure the website overall so that people can very easily kind of discern what's happening? I can digest this. I understand how things are organized. Okay. I know where to go to get what I need. How often should people be diving in, businesses be diving in and looking at refreshing their website? You know, if, if you really do it right, it, it should almost never be an issue of saying, hey, it, it's time for a complete redesign. It should really be a consistent iterative process. So if you're doing it right, you're constantly looking at the data on a regular basis. You're discerning insights from that data. You're analyzing it and you're saying, oh, okay, here, here, here's uh, pain points, right? Here's people where people are exiting the website. Here's a page with a, a high bounce rate. Here's a page where people aren't scrolling down as low as we'd like them to, to, to get some key critical information. And then you're testing, you're experimenting and saying, well, how do we fix that problem? So you're, you're changing the layout of the page, or maybe you're changing the, the navigation of the website. You make a change, you test it. Oh, that doesn't work. Well, that, let's try something else. You test it and that does work. Okay, where, where's another pain point? Let's test that. If you're constantly doing that, by its very nature, the website's going to change over time. And eventually, you know, after a couple of years, the website's going to begin to look differently. So in a sense, in essence, your, your, your customers are redesigning your website, right? Because you're, you're giving them these experiments, you're, you're giving them these uh, personalized experiences, you're using that to make decisions. And then by its nature, the website is, is changing and it's evolving over time. And it's kind of redesigning itself. 
And what I love is that you use the word experiments because that's what everything is. There's nothing that's like tried, proven, guaranteed anymore. A hundred percent not, a hundred percent not. And the beautiful thing is, is that, you know, how I react to something may be different than how you react to something. Um, and that's a good thing, right? Because maybe we're, we're in different segments because we live in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and you might, depending on your brand, you might find that, you know, people here in Florida react differently than people in California or New York. No, come on. <laughs> as crazy as that sounds, um, we could go on a whole tangent about that, but <laughs> I digress. Um, but yeah, and then being able to customize your website to say, well, we're going to treat people from Florida a little bit differently than people right. from California or New York. Again, if, if that makes sense for your product and services. And so when, when, you, when you're thinking about it like that on that level, uh, now you're really creating an experience that that really makes sense. And you're, and you're really digging into things to say, how do I best serve that particular customer? Well, the other word that you used, which I think is important and that people forget about is data. Like with all of the resources out there with heat maps where you can actually see where people are spending time on your website, what pages they're going to, what picture or what words or where yep. they're stopping on your page. There's so much insights available well beyond Google Analytics that I think most people, unless they are a developer or really dialed into design work, they mm -hmm. don't even know exists. Yeah. And, you know, all those things ultimately feed, right? They, they feed design because we all have a sense of what, you know, what we call best practice, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and those things are real. I mean, th those things aren't by any stretch a waste of time, but I think sometimes we forget that those are really just starting points. Mm -hmm. And then we use these other tools to enhance and build off of that. Um, so you mentioned experience analytics. So you've got these wonderful tools where you can do things from session replays to kind of, you know, tracking rage clicks where people are having issues and errors on the site. Um, you've got the event analytics like Google Analytics. To, Is the rage click that. kind of like when I hit there, sit there and hit zero, 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 zero <laughs> on hold on an automated dialer? <laughs> That's exactly it. That's the telephone version of the rage click. <laughs> uh, so yeah, a, a multitude of tools that can be used to, to gather just great insights and information and understand what people are doing. What are some of the common mistakes that people are making? Like besides the fact that they're not using data, they're not experimenting, and they're not using tools. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with um, the good job done in marketing in the world of SaaS. Um, so SaaS marketers, and you know, those are a lot of tools that you and I use on a regular basis from CRM tools to customer data platforms to experimentation and, uh, you know, ex experience analytics and a whole bunch of others. Um, they do a really good job of making it sound like once you have this tool, like your problems are solved. Like you put this tool in there and it's going to tell you exactly what to do. You like, you just, it's just going to give you this list of things to do. And you do all that and you're just a hundred percent ready to go. And, you know, marketers are customers too. And sometimes we buy into that. Um, then we get the tool and we spend a lot of money. And, and then it's just like, is anyone using this thing? Does, does anyone know what's going on? Um, as opposed to saying, what are we trying to accomplish? Let's lay out that strategy first. And then saying, okay, what tools do we need to accomplish that job, right? So just like if, I mean, if you're going to build something, you're not going to go out and buy this expensive set of tools and then say, okay, this is going to solve all my problems. It's just like, well, you just bought a bunch of auto tools and you need to build a shed. So, you know, it's, it's you know, what do you need? I need a shed. Okay, well, then these are the set of tools we need to be able to do that and accomplish that. And we really find a lot of times, you know, marketers reverse that. We get enamored by the technology instead of understanding that the technology is just an accelerator to what it is that we're trying to accomplish, which is uh, ultimately our plan and strategy that we need to lay out first. Yeah, like it's a good example where we use HubSpot and we started HubSpot and I, and I upgraded to it, even though it was way more than at the time six, eight years ago that we needed because mm -hmm. it was so easy for our team to be able to use it for blogging. And now huh. someone said, oh, I use HubSpot just for blogging. It'd be like, why do you spend that much money on software just to blog? But I was looking for something that was intern proof, not idiot proof, mm -hmm. intern yeah. proof that someone could go in and dial in on. But then I learned that I had so many other tools, but I needed to actually hire people to help me figure <laughs> out how to do the tools because I didn't have the time in the day to actually do that. Right. And so then you get clunky, big technology that can save the day and do fantastic things for you, but you don't know how to actually use it. 
Yeah, and, and we see that, and you know, from small companies to large enterprises, um, you know, all the time that they run into that. They just spend a lot more money on those tools than than you and I can probably, you know, be able to spend. But uh, but they run into the, the, the exact same problems. And so, what else do people do that sometimes makes you raise your eyebrow? And go, hmm. Um, you know, we, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, you know, about what happens pre-click versus post-click. Mm -hmm. And we get kind of trapped into the idea that every problem is an advertising problem. Um, you know, if we have an issue and we're not driving the kind of revenue that we want, well, the solution is, well, it's, it's an advertising thing. Like we need to spend more money or we need to spend you know more money in the right place. And that can be the problem. <laughs> But a lot of times that's not the problem. It's that you're 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 driving good traffic, a lot of times even quality traffic. It's just, and you gave the example beautifully before, it's just like, yeah, I don't know where to go once I get here. I, I don't know where to find what it is that I'm looking for after that click. So it's again that challenge of saying, I need to think through the entire experience. I need to think through certainly the ad and the message and the creative, but then what happens after the person clicks? How am I playing off that message? How am I playing off that creative? How am I delivering with the kind of information the person needs at the right time? And how am I leading them all the way through the funnel to actually convert so that to your point, they can reduce their, their customer acquisition costs and, and really maximize their ad dollar. So instead of spending all that money up front and thinking, well, let's throw more money at the problem, perhaps the issue is, well, let's make it easier for people to find what they're looking for. And really that's lower hanging fruit because you've already got those people to yeah. the site. They want to do something. Let's make it easier for them to do something. And now all of a sudden you're, you're getting more out of the money that you're already spending on the upfront, on the upfront advertising. I mean, it's pretty clear and easy. If you're getting a lot of people to your site, but you're not getting sales to actually transfer, translate into anything, there, there's a broken process somewhere because people are not coming just to learn. People want an end-all solution and that's why they're there. Exactly. But the easier thing to do is just that it's just to spend against the problem. It's it's easier just to say, well, we need to spend more on Google. We need to spend more on Meta. We need to spend more on LinkedIn. That's easier to do than it is to investigate and understand where is the flaw in our user experience. Mm -hmm. How do we address that flaw? You know, we don't want to do that scary experiment thing. <laughs> you know, all, all those things kind of get in the way, and it's easier to say, ah, you know. We'll just we'll just drive more traffic, and you know that that's how we'll solve the problem, and that's just a dangerous trap. And again, we, we talk about those companies that are doing well, that are setting the standard, that are really moving forward. They're all experimenting. That that's how they're moving things forward. They're they're iterating on what they're doing. They're not just kind of settling for the status quo and just kind of covering it over, as it were, with with advertising dollars. What are you seeing with pricing transparency? Because I think this is a big one out there. I mean, we're used to being able to go in, jump in and find out exactly what something costs and then price shop it to our heart's content. Are you finding that more companies are, you know, opening up the metrics a little bit and letting people have insight? Or is it still more of a hiddenness that is it's not something that's quite as in front and open? Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because you kind of see both extremes. And I think part of that, part of it anyway, depends on the brand and, and how they want to position themselves. So you, you do see a lot of that transparency, which is always nice to see. But then you have also on the other extreme, you have that, you know, the more dynamic pricing models that are really coming into play more and more. And we see it when we, you know, when we order an Uber or anything like that, right? Depending on the time of day and what part of the, what part of the city that we're in, um, we see that dynamic pricing really come into the play. Um, which can be for the consumer, um, you know, it it could be a, a huge challenge. It could be something that customers can uh, or the companies can really take advantage of. It, it kind of just depends how the brands position it and how they use it. Mm -hmm. You can understand you're in business to make money. So you're trying to maximize the dollars that you're trying to make in a particular situation. But, you know, there's a fine line between maximizing that and alienating the consumer because you feel like you're, you're just trying to you know, kill me with with fees and you're trying to squeeze every last dollar from my soul, <laughs> you know, oh. as opposed to saying, hey, just just, you know, just be fair with me and transparent about what this is going to cost and what this is going to do. So we, we've seen it on both cases, um, depending on the product and service that's being offered. Um, and I think it's really about how it's positioned, right? How, how you're positioning it, how you're kind of communicating what you're doing from a pricing standpoint mm -hmm. so that people can understand like, hey, it's, it's busier. So, you know, we're going to charge more. It's, it's a premium. In principle, people understand that they may not like it. Supply and but... demand, <laughs> but they, you know, they understand it in principle. So, 
It's, it's amazing how long one will try to wait out that Uber with the <laughs> rising prices. Come on, is it going to go down in seven minutes? Let's see. Maybe it'll wait. <laughs> Now, I think that with pricing, it's also, it's really difficult sometimes because you lose some storytelling. Like you, mm-hmm. it's, you, it's a very easy thing for someone, you know, with SaaS pricing, you see it. We're used to software. We can see what you're purchasing and then that is it. And it's listed on the website or, but when it starts getting into some more specialties and tweaks and things along yep. those lines, unless you've done a really good job being very clear about how everything works you can lose people. And that's the scary thing about transparency. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Um, and you know, people, you know, sometimes it's, you, you want to give people a lot of credit to kind of figure things out on their own. Um, but you know, when you're in shopping mode, um, you know, you want the least amount of friction as possible. Yeah. And the more work you have to do, especially if you're in a rush, you're trying to maybe buy something between meetings at work, or you're trying to get something on your phone while you're in the waiting room or something like that. You, you don't have time for that friction. Like, you know, it's just like, you know what, I'll just do it later. And unfortunately, a lot of times do it later is do it never. It just, it just never comes back up. So it's so important to capture that consumer in the moment. And the only way to do that is to make it very simple and very straightforward so that you don't get that that friction and that confusion that can be caused by, um, as you just like you mentioned, just having just too many components, too many pieces and parts. Uh, I have to do too much math on the fly to try to figure out exactly what this is going to cost me in order to make that purchase I want to make. What are other things that people do that sometimes you wonder why your clients have gone down this path? Hmm. I think I, I you know, sometimes we, we run into clients and I wonder um, what they're thinking in terms of what they need from a resource standpoint. Um, so whether it's a third party agency like ourselves or whether there's, there's hiring internally, um, I, I wonder what they're thinking in terms of the skill sets they need. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think they sometimes don't quite understand the, the importance and value of having specialists. Mm-hmm. Um, generalists are certainly extraordinarily valuable too, but you also need to have those specialists. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it becomes, and this is probably an extreme example, but it's like, hey, we we have we have this, this person who can code, they're a developer. Oh, and they know that analytics stuff too. So we had them do our analytics. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, well, I mean, I'm sure they know some of that, but you're kind of treating them like a jack of all trades and you probably really want someone who's an analyst to do your analytics and you want someone who's a developer to do your coding, right? Um, and just not understanding the, the value of that sometimes, they end up hurting themselves by not having the right specialists in, in place or the right specialty resources in place to really say, okay, this is what we're going to do from a paid media management standpoint. This is what we're going to do in terms of data analysis. This is what we're going to do in terms of design. This is what we're going to do in terms of coding. And just understanding the value of having a, you know, a specialist. Just like when you go to see the doctor, um, if you have a particular problem, yeah, doctors are, are generalists and they're, they're trained in a lot of things. But you know, if I have a problem with my heart, I, I'd like someone who spent a few years studying the heart specifically. <laughs> you know, If I have a problem with my brain, I'd like to speak to someone who spent a few years studying the brain specifically because they're going to be more likely to be able to more quickly identify my problem. They're going to give me more options in terms of how to how to deal with my problem. So in the same way, you're going to get more options. And you're, you're going to get um, along the road farther if you get people who are, who are specialists in certain areas, as opposed to kind of um, minimizing the importance of certain areas of, of digital marketing by kind of just saying, well, this person can do that too. Well, if anyone out there has who's listening has ever hired someone who was supposed to do your back end and your front end of either a <laughs> database or a website, you know the sheer utter hell you have thrown yourself <laughs> into because those are very different mindsets and skill sets. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I, I have experienced that pain in my corporate life and learned that lesson the hard way. <laughs> I have done it many times myself, and I've seen a lot of clients do it also. Do you think that someone who knows how to do web development can just do web development? Right. It doesn't mean they know how to write, and it does not know, mean that they know how to do graphics. Exactly. It's it's like, well, oh, you're you're a doctor. Like I like I have I have a pain in my arm. Like yeah, I'm I'm not that kind of doctor. <laughs> I don't specialize in that. And sometimes when we don't know something or we don't understand, it's, it's easy just to kind of clump it all together and just kind of say, well, you you did it. Oh, you know how that internet thing works. Okay, well, help help me with this. And it's like, well, that, that internet thing is, is pretty varied and diverse. Like, you know, that, that's not my area of specialty. So helping people to better understand that, which I think people are starting to come along in that, in that realm, but there's still a good road to go there. So. 
Now, one of the things you were talking about was experimenting and making sure that you're going back and you're revisiting your website and you're tweaking it and you're adding to it. Now, one of the ways to fast track that, and I think something that Google really likes with SEO is if you're adding content that is valuable. So is that something that you work with your um, clients on a lot with like whether it's blog or video or other content to help make their websites more robust beyond the actual general structure? Yeah, for sure. I mean, leveraging content, you know, whether it's showing subject matter expertise or, or giving tips for customers that that fit your, your particular profile, um, all those things are super valuable. Uh, they certainly help rank on Google and drive that quality traffic. Um, and then to your point, when it comes to experimentation, it's it's saying, okay, well, how do we deliver and structure this content in a way that's going to say, okay, now that I understand this, now that my question has been answered, what's kind of the next logical step in this process? It could be a micro conversion. It could be, well, how about you sign up for an email and, and hear a little bit more from us about this, right. right? And then in the email, then the content now plays a different role because now it's like, well, how do we build value in the brand and value in our products and services to kind of move them to say, oh, okay, well, may maybe I actually want to purchase this or I want to sign up for this. Mm -hmm. So content plays such a critical role. It's a matter of trying to position the right content in the right time in the right way, mm -hmm. which again, all comes down to experimentation. And even when you experiment and you kind of get that 80-20 rule and you're like, okay, I've got it working for like 80% of the people, which is great. Then you kind of take the data and you break that 80% of the people down into those different target segments. And then you understand, well, it works really well for this segment, but not at all well for this segment. Okay, great. Well, let's, let's target this segment of people with this process that we already have defined and this content and how we're showing it. Now, what does this segment need and how do we target them? which then brings a whole other set of robust experimentation. So experimentation becomes this, this big cycle, this, this, um, this deep cycle. The problem is that people are scared to get started. Um, and that, that really is what holds people back. So really you have a different title and your name and title should be data scientist. <laughs> I am far from that. <laughs> That's a specialty I don't have. I'm not that kind of doctor. <laughs> With the advent of AI, and we're hearing about that a lot right now. And that's affecting website. That's affecting content. I mean, for gosh sakes, you can now actually have Jarvis or another entity online write your content for you. Where do you see this going? What do you think is going to happen in the future? You know, I think it's going to um, speed up the process, so to speak. Um, and when I say that, what I mean is we talked a lot about experimentation and iteration already. I think it's going to speed up the process of experimentation and iteration. Um, I don't think that's ever going to go away. Um, we, we humans are a finicky bunch. Uh, we're, we're pretty hard to figure out, even for a really smart computer. Um, you know, we change a lot. Um, we have a lot of the market is constantly in flux and changing. Competitors are changing. Um, so the idea of experimenting and iterating is constant. I think AI is going to feed that cycle and allow us to, to make those experiments and changes a lot faster on a, on a much faster scale than we have before, um, which is good because we have all this data that, you know, we've been gathering all, you know, these last few years, data has become so, so big. Now it's an opportunity to really leverage and use that data um, on a consistent basis and really start kind of pushing out iterations and, and seeing where it, can, where it can take us. Well, how can I, how can our listeners find out more about you? They're like, I have a website. I need to figure out what to do with this, or maybe I'm doing a good job, maybe I'm not. How can they reach out? Well, they can certainly reach us at smartpandalabs.com. Um, or if they just want to kind of check out how I think about things and, and see if it resonates and makes sense to them, they can certainly follow me on LinkedIn. I, I try to share my thoughts there consistently. And, and that way, it's a good way to judge and kind of say, you know, this guy makes sense, or, you know, he's completely out of his mind, I want nothing to do with him. So either way, they, they get to the side. Are there any last words or parting advice if you had to say this year, this is what you need to do? What would you tell our listeners? Be determined if you haven't already to run your first A-B test. Just, just run, run, run a test. Um, get a taste for, for what it is to experiment and have your customers tell you what's a better way to do this rather than depending on your experience or your gut to make that decision. Well, Shamir, thank you so much for joining us today. I know that I love talking about this and, he, and it makes my wheels turn in my head about all the things that we need to do. And I'm lucky that we have some good people on our team to help us out. But 
if someone needs help, please reach out to Shamir. Look into the opportunities. There's so much that you can do to completely decapitate your business if you have not dialed in your website. It's really one of the most important aspects of your business today, unless you just have people stopping by a retail storefront and don't ever have to find you and they just stumble on you because that's how they're finding you. Um, so thank you. Really do appreciate it. Thank you so much, Stacey. I really enjoyed being on. I'm so happy you had me. Of course. And then to our listeners, thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. I look forward to chatting with you this next week. And until then, if you have any questions about how to leverage your own content in other people's worlds, such as with influencers or product placement and movies and TV shows and getting your brand front and center, please reach out to my agency, Hollywood Branded, and we look forward to chatting with you. Have a great one.